had summed that up, didn't it? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. What well, a lovely welcome, and absolutely delighted to see so many faces, both old, new, and interim, interim ones as well. <laughs> so it's great. And absolutely delighted to have Greens representing the whole of the islands here today. Um, and I think that that's a powerful message to be sending out, that we do not stand alone here in Northern Ireland. Um, we are relevant right throughout the world. We are part of the Green European movement and the network and right across these aisles as well. So thank you very much for your presence. Um, it's a bit strange standing here and talking to you as, uh, as the leader in the my first conference speech. Um, delighted that there's so many new faces coming forward as well uh, for our council elections in May. Um, Selections are still ongoing, so we're going to keep you on tender hooks for the official announcement. But uh, a lot of people coming forward, renewed energy, um, and an absolutely great selection of our party members as candidates. Um, I think it's really indicative that we launch ourselves in that campaign with the brand new logos, with the brand new freshness, with a brand new look, because there is a brand new feel going on in this party, and. Uh, that's not to say there's a brand new feel going on in politics in general, but we'll maybe come back to there. But standing here as the leader of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, um, I have to reflect really on where I started and how I got into politics and, and how I stand here before you and how unexpected maybe that would have been. But um, going back to my childhood, I'm from a very working class background. I'm very proud of that. And sometimes we get labelled as being a middle class party. Um, just looking around this room, I uh, think that can knock that out of the park as well. We are a party for everyone, not just something. Um, but I was born into a two up, two down, with an outside toilet and no bathroom. I remember when we left Belfast and moved to Antrim, my sister and I in my dad's car in our swimming costumes and our wee rubber hats because there was a bath in this new house in Central Heaton. And we used to think it was a swimming pool and my dad was decorating the house. Um, but I was born in the Falls Road. A lot of my childhood, I grew up in Holland, and that was the work that my mum did and brought us with her. I have Italian blood. I carry a British passport, and I'm Irish. So I see myself as an internationalist, not a nationalist. Certainly not an ethno-nationalist, as is common in our politics. So politics was very hard for me to fit into in Northern Ireland. I think growing up as a woman in Northern Ireland, regardless of your constitutional or political affiliations, the first and most obvious thing when you looked at me was I was a woman. So therefore I was always treated as a woman, whatever that may be. The language, the attitudes, and the physicality of people around me is culturally centered around me being a woman. And I noticed that. I always noticed that I couldn't wear trousers to school, for example. Why did I always have to go to school in the corned beef legs? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an Irish twin. My sister is 11 months older than me. I think that's a bit of a, a general common theme in Northern Ireland as well. <laughs> Sorry, Mum. <laughs> But this meant that my sister and I, she was the oldest in, in our school year, and I was the youngest. So we started P1 this, at the same year, and we traveled the right way through school together in the same year. Um, so that wore us out, and we fell out when we were teenagers for a long time. But when we were living in Antrim, the housing estate we lived on was a mixed housing estate. So we had Catholics and Protestants and others living together, and everybody got on grand. We had a Catholic primary and a Protestant primary school on the estate, and we went to our different schools, and we all knew we said, the our father, we bit different, and that was grand. And we all played, and we were all friends, and it was all grand. And in 1981, Lagan College, first, Northern Ireland's first ever planned integrated school opened, and my mum took the brave decision that my sister and I would go, and we were two of the first 28 pupils to go to that school. So while the world's media was looking on, we were just going to school. And there was only 28 of us, and we were from all different class and backgrounds. But we were all friends, and it was all grand. 
and where people were protesting at the doors because they didn't want Catholic and Protestant children taught together. We just went to school in a scout hall and got on with it. So 38 years later, that school is one of the most oversubscribed in Northern Ireland, have just got their first purpose-built school and is one of the most front-running leading schools that we have. But it's still a desperate pity that 38 years later, Northern Ireland only has 65 integrated schools, both primary and post-primary. Because to me, integrated education was the biggest challenge to the system of its day. It was the biggest effort of peace building that a handful of parents and concerned people did themselves. We need to support that because be under no illusion, peace has not yet been achieved in Northern Ireland. The absence of violence does not mean that we live in peace. So looking for a political party to join in Northern Ireland was a bit tricky. I was a lone parent. My kids got up and into school and I decided I would put myself through education again. Um, I ended up, this all ended up, nothing too much pre-planned, <laughs> at Queen's University and I did a politics degree. In my final year, we were living in private rental accommodation. We were made homeless through no, no fault of our own. We were given our notice to quit and find ourselves homeless. So living on a student loan with two children, one making the transition from primary into post-primary, the other meant to be sitting an 11 plus, and myself to finish my final year at university. It was a pretty tough year and an experience that will never leave me. When my children were growing up, again as a lone parent, I didn't have a steady income. Childcare was much too expensive, especially when you had two. Working tax credits didn't exist then. Important to note that a childcare strategy still doesn't exist now. So it was tough. But I realised that if you want to see change happen, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do to make that change? I can no longer sit back and wait for somebody to do it for me. Because all my life I've been listening to politics and those in politics talking. And it was the Charlie Brown teacher voice of wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Didn't make sense to my life and it certainly wasn't relatable to my experiences. And they were not talking about my future and my needs or any crisis that I had come through. So who was going to be that change and how was it going to do it? And it was while I was studying politics at Queen's University, Professor John Barry at the back happened to be my tutor. <laughs> and through the, those studies, I bumped into the Green Party as an actual political party. And I think I'd probably heard about them before and voted for them before, along with the Munster Raven Looney Party and all the others, because I didn't want the normal or the norms or the usual suspects to keep going. So I started looking at them. And there just happened to be elections coming up. And I started having a look to see who they were, what they were doing, how they operated, what were these motions, what was an AGM, how did you pass things? Uh, and it was great. It was really, really refreshing. But I instantly knew that I could join this party, be me, and they would welcome me in, that I had something to bring to the party, and the party had a lot to teach me. And that was a great experience. And I thank you for it. So standing here as the leader, a few years, few years later, was not something I was looking at back then. Being an elected MLA, I stood for elections, I suppose, trying to take it on as the challenge, and then wondering what to do with it when I got it. I knew, I knew what I was wanting to do. I wanted elected for a reason. I wanted to be a member of a legislative assembly for a reason. I wanted to challenge laws or no laws. I wanted to make the change. I had watched Stephen Agnew for his mandate before, being able to come forward and produce a bill that was recognised, passed, and is now an act. The Children's Services, the Children's Cooperation, Cooperation and Services <laughs> Act, and has royal assent. And that is a huge achievement, and well done. Yeah. I wanted to repeat something similar. <coughs> but what did I get instead? So despite climate change, 
been the most urgent and the biggest threat for all our futures. 12 years to the point of no return if we do not radically alter how we are, what we do and our relations together, we will reach the point of no return in terms of climate change and climate breakdown. I think that's pretty urgent. But instead, we have Brexit. <coughs> Brexit. <laughs> I asked Patrick Harvey before I came in, what is all this? 49 days to go until we are going to exit the EU. Patrick, what is Brexit? And he says, do you not know Brexit means Brexit? <laughs> and I just don't understand. <laughs> but we're there. And we're having our troubles and our vacuums. But it should not be forgotten that Brexit is an outright result of the pursuance of the British government and their first past the post electoral system. That electoral system at Westminster has given rise to an ultra-adversarial system which pits two parties against each other. The system that creates the, uh, created the conditions and led to the EU referendum. And that was marked by misinformation and division. And similarly here in Northern Ireland, with our previous executive, that descended into a two-party system which was characterised by suspicion, mistrust and ill will. So now we have no assembly, but we've got Brexit. up. So wanting elected, wanting to make the change, we now have Brexit backed up with the other discussion from the other side about border polls. And all my life I have heard about a united Ireland, and all my life I've never heard what that is. So how can I live my life, and I'm quite old. <laughs> And hear this all the time, and nobody's put a plan together. Bre <coughs> Brexit, anybody? Border polls and a new Ireland is coming forward as the, the discourse to counteract Brexit. But if we are bounced into a border poll conference, be in no doubt that it will be Brexit part two. To ask the people to go to vote or into a referendum without knowing what the final result will be, will be Brexit part two. So for all my life to hear about a united Ireland and yet we've no picture of what that would be, is simply the wrong way to go, the wrong reaction and not the time. So for political parties who have advocated for a united Ireland, my call to them is, what is that? Talk to us, tell us, because I have no vision in my head about what you mean. Does that simply mean that we go for a referendum to remove the border and be sucked into the system of the South, the governance system in the South, where recently we watched the state guards move into a community in Ross Common and remove people from their homes and leave them on the streets, state destitution. Where across this island we've seen NAMA, we've seen political corruption. Is that what? A unified Ireland really means. With climate change coming, being no doubt that a new Ireland is coming, she's on her way, but she just might not be the one that you've been thinking about. But we will have to urgently renegotiate our relationships across these islands, our behaviours, our lifestyles, and how we do business with each other. And for me, that's the urgent question that needs to be addressed for a new Ireland, whether it's within the union or whether it's unified with itself. <coughs> and in all that, we have no assembly. We have no executive. We have no government. Two years and counting, we have had nowhere to sit and find a political space, to find commonalities, shared outcomes, debate, discuss the urgent crisis that grows. 
And I have a quote from someone I never thought I would be quoting in my life. But recently, and Westminster were taking the second vote on Theresa May's withdrawal deal. And there were amendments going through, one column for an extension to Article 50. So Arlene Foster was standing on the Westminster Green outside Parliament. Yeah, Arlene Foster, leader of the DUP, MLA, <laughs> not MP, who can't reach agreement to get Stormont up and going, where she's an MLA, on the Westminster Green, <laughs> talking to the BBC. And they asked her about extension of Article 50. And she said, and I quote, I don't think, speaking sorry about the Theresa, Theresa May's response, I don't think that's the route she'll go down because that risks splitting her own party. I think that's not what she wants to do. She is very clear that she doesn't want to extend Article 50 and I agree with her on that. The reason I agree with her is because if you put off the end date, then you're never going to get a deal. So let's get a deal. Let's make it work, and let's make it work for the whole of the United Kingdom. You know that, you know that in negotiations in Northern Ireland, that's when we get into that sort of territory, coming to the end of a process, that really concentrates the mind. So if Europe wants a deal with the United Kingdom, let's get on and get a deal with everyone. They were pretty wise words, I thought. <laughs> And it got me thinking that maybe Arlene should listen to herself. <laughs> maybe she should apply that logic to getting negotiations started here, to reinstate the assembly and get her job back. Just imagine if our Secretary of State came out and supported that as well. Just a thought. But people are angry, and rightly so, and we are angry. But there's a strange mood in the public at the same time. There's much disappointment, but I'm also sensing a resignation. A lot of people coming to the conclusion and accepting, sure, what else would you expect? What else could you expect? This is the type... It only serves to maintain the status quo. And who wins? Those in power. And who loses? Everybody else. And the losers in that everybody else are most highlighted in the growing inequalities that we have here in Northern Ireland. Growing inequalities for women in their rights, in their economic equity, in their life opportunities, inequalities in language rights, poverty at levels we thought were long gone. We have 100,000 children here in Northern Ireland living in poverty, and 20,000 of those living in housing stress or homeless. Suicide, more deaths by suicide, in Northern Ireland in the past 20 years than were ever killed or murdered during our troubles. A drugs epidemic at levels we have not begun to contemplate. And when a friend of mine buried her son just before Christmas through a drugs overdose, the coroner told her that that was the sixth body he'd received that morning. That didn't even make the news. The levels of deprivation in Northern Ireland, static within communities. We know where they are, some of them the most deprived in the whole of Western Europe. 
the PSNI telling us that they have received the highest recorded reports of domestic and sexual violence incidences last year since their records began. The failure to tackle growing mental health problems, our inability to interject with intergenerational trauma, therefore making everything bigger, wider, and more problematic. Homelessness, there's a growing housing crisis in Northern Ireland fueled by the lack of a social housing build and so-called welfare reform. I've lived through that experience and it's a painful one. But welfare reform again on its own and the onslaught of universal credit and the Tories obsession with austerity. I'm proud that leading figures within the <coughs> Green Movement such as Caroline Lucas, Patrick Harvey and the Scottish Greens and even Philippe Lambert across the European networks have all been steadfast in their opposition to the austerity agenda. Austerity needs ended, welfare reform needs stopped, and reform in the best interest of people needs to be established. Mm. And let's look at our legacy, our legacy of the past, our lack of peace building, We've had a political process over a peace process. If we'd had a, had a peace process, we could have made moves in reconciliation and community divides. But instead, we've got more and longer and bigger peace walls throughout Northern Ireland than we ever did through the conflict. We have victims and survivors of violence who've never received any reparations, who won't be acknowledged in getting a state pension even. We've got this victims and survivors from the historical abuse inquiry dying after the inquiry made recommendations for reparations that they still have never received. The last one died on Christmas Day this year. So the International Panel on Climate Change tells us that we will all be affected in 12 years if we don't make the moves. So that got me thinking about Northern Ireland's environmental record. Oops. <laughs> we have the recent public concerns that has been spread all over social media. I'm sure you've picked up on it. Um, regarding radioactive waste dumps being uh, identified for areas in Warren Point. Nuclear waste, radioactive waste down around our beauty spots and waterways. <coughs> we have the ongoing saga of Muboy under the Environment Minister of the previous <coughs> mandate. The largest illegal dump in the whole of the Western Europe was found and we're still paying to clean that up. And the environmental contamination it has caused will go on for generations. We've got gold mining trying to come into our sparing mountains. <coughs> And following this one gold mine from Dalradian, we're led to believe that many other hard mineral mining companies will follow. Have you heard of RHI? <laughs> <laughs> Not just the environmental disaster and the, corrupt, the corruptness of a green scheme, but the failures of governance, the failures of leadership and the corruption at the heart of our government was just laid bare throughout that inquiry. <coughs> and we are to see the report coming forward in March. And next, we're looking at biogas digesters. I said biogas because I have to say anaerobic really slowly, unless I get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so anaerobic digesters are now being investigated. Another whole big, huge scheme that was implemented right across the UK um, <coughs> and not looking good. So our Northern Ireland auditor, is currently investigating that, and estimations are telling us that it will dwarf RHI. So it's not looking too good. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to bring us back, conference. I want to bring us back <coughs> and get you to remember what our activism, what our determination, and what our political messaging has done, has been achieved and will continue to build on. Because you 
our members, you've led the way in so many areas on so many issues. You, our members, have led the way in the fight for marriage equality because green means equality. And Stephen bringing the first assembly debate on this, and I always remember the slogan, in the courts or on the hill, equal marriage, yes we will. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll go for that one. <laughs> and unfortunately, it will be the courts, and many couples are challenging this at our courts. But green also means abortion law reform. And you, our members, leading the way on that to become the first elected party to support full decriminalisation because we understand that no woman should ever face criminal sanctions for her right to choose. Yeah. And green means welcoming our new communities because you, our members, know that we all thrive in a diverse and pluralist, integrated society. We can't move forward if we don't learn and grow with each other. And green means animal welfare. And while we're proud here in Northern Ireland to have some of the strongest legislation in place to protect animals, we are constantly disappointed that it is not better utilised and we see others limiting their understanding of animal rights as pet rights. And green means sustainable development. And you, our members and our activists, out campaigning for community-based development needs and not developer greed. There are many, many more, but I'm timed today. But let me say that if anyone attempts to criticise us for being small and irrelevant, tell them that it's not size that matters, <laughs> it's what you do with it that counts. <laughs> it's not electoral data, numbers of seats, one that matters. That's what I meant to say, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we measure political success by the ability to affect meaningful change for society. And that's why we all became involved in politics. And that's why I'm delighted that you've all chose the Green Party. Because you <coughs> make the change. So this is your time. This is your Green Call, the action. Just going to do a sweep of the room. Is there hands up? Anybody in the room that's not a party member? First one up. What do you do? Not yet. Right now, sir. Sorry, where were those hands? <laughs> well, people, you know what to do. And it's not hard. So please, join the party. If you're a party member, get your family members, get your friends, get your communities, get the people that you're speaking to, get the message out. Ask them, be proud to ask them to join this party, to stand with us, to help us grow, and to come out and campaign with us. Because we have council elections in May. And I want every candidate that we're running to have a great team around them. Because despite having a few, and again, we're down to size, members on councils, they have achieved so much. They have changed the political discourse. They have gotten motions through. But I'm so proud because they call for action. They don't call for reports. They call for action. And that's what's needed. So if you're not a party member, I'm going to come back and get you. <laughs> <laughs> But we're weeks off a council election, and you've met some of our key candidates who sat on the panel this morning. And they're standing in seats that will be hard fought, but they will be won. We have Malachi, who doesn't want them to be Queen of the Castle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm at that party. <laughs> <laughs> Anya Grogan working so hard 
out in Botanic facing a five seat contest. <coughs> Brand Smith doing sterling work for Liz and Shara. Can't name that one, sorry, because they haven't been announced yet. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Dunlop, absolutely thrilled and delighted to have you on board, and you're going to be excellent. And of course, Councillors Georgina Milne, Councillor Rachel Woods, Councillor Barry McKee, all doing sterling, outstanding work, calling for action, demanding change, and shaping a new conversation. Who doesn't want more of that? <laughs> so if you haven't been out knocking a door just yet, don't be afraid. Knocking doors is great crack. <laughs> and I remember the first time, uh, I think it was the 2010 election, and being asked to go out and canvas, I'm being really nervous about it. And I attempted about four times to go out and help our candidate to canvas. And halfway down the road, just freaked out and turned to my room again. And no, how can you go and knock a stranger's door? Um, but when you do it, the energy, the buzz, and the learning that you get. And most people, all people, 99.9% .9 of people, are either delighted to see you, or just dead on that you called. So if that's the worst that you're getting, please come out. When you get the emails asking for help, whether it's been for leaflets, for canvassing, for fundraising, for party organising, for local group activity, get behind them. Because there's so much fun to be had when you're changing the world. <laughs> but we do learn from history that we do not learn from history. <laughs> and this means that it is our duty to look to the future rather than the past. Because the future means that we will see Greens returned to Council very shortly. Green, looking to the future means that we're watching the development of us as a party grow in confidence, grow in numbers, and grow in representation. I couldn't be more proud of all of you, and I couldn't be more proud to be part of this party. And I am absolutely incredibly proud to go forward for now as the leader of the Green Party Northern Ireland. Thank you, conference.